ready. Share it all with screeny o. That one, I think. It's not what I want to see. I want to see this. All right. You guys have uh, the big distillation up on the screen there? You bet. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Perfect. All right, so three objectives in this ILM on distillation. First objective here is uh, basic defining the terms related to distillation control. And there is a lot of terms in this ILM, as you will soon discover. Um, but we'll make you familiar with them. And uh, this is one of the funner labs that you guys get to do this year is uh, playing with our fancy dancy distillation column that we got at the college here. I don't know if you've seen it or not seen it, but we happen to have a pretty decent little distillation column outside there. And uh, it's, it's lots of fun. It's usually kind of a, one of the highlights of, of the four year program. So you guys will enjoy doing that. All right, let's look at some terms here. Distillation, of course, we're gonna start out with defining that, the process in which components of a liquid mixture separate through vaporization and condensation. So we heat up a, a mixture of uh, two liquids to a certain temperature. Um, now at, some, at that point, some of it vaporizes, starts rising up the distillation column, and then we condense it uh, into a liquid. And by doing that, we separate the components. Vapor pressure is a common term that we've heard uh, throughout the course in third year as well as fourth year. So hopefully this is a review. And I always use the jerry can example. Um, as a good visual representation of what is vapor pressure. And the fancy definition for it is the pressure that a gas exerts in equilibrium with a solid or liquid in a closed container at a given temperature. And basically that's a fancy way of saying if you screw the cap on a uh, jerry can tightly and you keep the gas in there at the given temperature, it's gonna be uh, a certain pressure based on the temperature. And that really is the concept um, that distillation works on for separating. Volatile, a uh, common term here, means easy to evaporate or also easy to light on fire. A binary liquid, of course, bi for two is made up of two components. And a little blurb here, which isn't really a uh, term, uh, vapor from a boiling mixture will contain a higher percentage of the more volatile component. Um, so what it works out with volatility is the more volatile a component is, the lower temperature at which it will turn into a vapor. So if you imagine a, uh, a container that's got water in it and gasoline in it mixed together, um, and, and you were to heat it up, we know that water boils at 100 uh, hydrocarbons boil at temperatures lower than 100. So if I had that temperature at 90, uh, there wouldn't be much evaporation of the water because it doesn't evaporate until it gets to be 100. Uh, hydrocarbons will evaporate somewhere in the range from 70 to 90 degrees kind of thing. So all of the pressure that's generated inside that container at 80 degrees, for example, would all be the more volatile or the lighter fraction, the, the gasoline portion, and you wouldn't even get a contribution from the water until you got up to 100 degrees where the water started to vaporize. So that's in very general terms, the idea behind distillation again. Okay, so the next couple of pages in the ILM here on, on page two kind of explain um, that concept I just uh, described to you in, in more lengthy terms and for some reason I've included it here in the ILM. I'm not I'm not in, in the PowerPoint I mean I'm not exactly sure why but mathematically if we look at uh, a combination of water and methanol in a container at 80 degrees Celsius so we take a jerry can for example or whatever container you can imagine and we have a mixture some kind of a mixture of water and methanol at that temperature the methanol component is going to contribute 178 kpas of vapor pressure inside that container and the water is only going to contribute 47 kpas 
at that temperature. And again, the reason is, is that water doesn't even turn into vapor necessarily until it gets to be 100 degrees. That's why this pressure is, is so much lower. So then we look at the partial pressure, which is the, uh, the contribution of each of the components. One is one part, one is the other part. So it's called partial, partial pressure. So it's a relationship between the amount of liquid that's in that container and the pressure that's generated from the vapor that's uh, evaporating from that liquid. And that's called the partial pressure. That's a lot to wrap your head around, but it's not really that complicated. So inside of this container, uh, we're going to have the partial pressures from both the water and the methanol, uh, each contributing a, a certain amount of pressure inside that container. So when we talk about the pressure in the, con in the container, we call it the total pressure, and it is essentially the, the partial pressure of component 1, 47 in this case, and the partial pressure of component 2, 178 in this case. So if we're looking at the partial pressure inside this vessel, it would be uh, 178 plus 47, that would be the total pressure inside the container. Then we can take from that calculation, uh, we can calculate the percentage of vapor, which is a function of the partial pressure uh, of the individual component divided into the total pressure of the two components. So we can find out what percentage is water based on the pressure and what percentage is methanol based on the pressure. So that leads us up into the next map here, which says calculate the vapor percentage for methanol and also for water in a closed system when the liquid percentage of the mix that we're starting with is 40% methanol and 60% water. So long drawn out explanation here, but basically what we have is a, a mixture in a container, this box that contains 40% methanol and 60% water. So in order to figure out what the concentration uh, is with this at a given temperature of 80 degrees, Celsius here, so we're using the same example here. Um, we know that at that temperature, water contributes 47 kPa, methanol contributes 178 kPa. So we have to then add the concentrations given to some relatively simple math. So in this case, if we take the 40% of our uh, feedstock, that's methanol, we multiply 0.4 times our 178 kPa's, that will give us uh, 71 kPa's. If we take our 0.6, that represents our 60% component of water, multiply that by its vapor pressure at 80 degrees, that gives us 28 kPa's, so 28 to 71, uh, pretty close to 100, let's say. I think the math numbers, they round up and that's what they got going on over here. So 72%, 28% tells us what the vapor percentages are when we vaporize a mix of 40% methanol and 60% water at 80 degrees. Where is this going? It's a relationship between temperature and the amount of vaporization that we get. So if I were to raise or lower this temperature, the concentrations are going to change. And that's what we're going to look at here in the next slide, where we now have a uh, temperature that's a little bit colder. Okay, so keep this in mind. What happens when the temperature is a little bit colder? Go ahead. Are you changing slides or are we still looking at distillation process page two? Oh, Shizen. I'm looking at my, damn, I just did all that to myself. Uh, well, I was following, like, all that stuff is on page two, so I was following along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you know what? I got, I got the dual screens going on here, my little screen with my notes on it, and then I got the big screen on the right, and I was turning my screen and not your screen. So yeah. now, you can see the, now you can see the screen I'm talking about? Yeah, you bet. Yeah, I can see your cursor there, too. Yeah. Okay, so if you weren't paying attention, or if you didn't, weren't following along in the textbook again here, we're looking at 80 degrees Celsius. How much vapor pressure do we get? From a mixture that contains 40% methanol and 60% water. So if we know that at this temperature, water contributes 47 kPa's vapor pressure, methanol contributes 178 kPa's uh, of, of pressure, then we, we take our percentages here. So 0.4 representing 40% times our uh, 178 kPa's here gives us 71 kPa's. 
we take our 0.6, representing 60% of the water, multiply that by 47 kPa's. That gives us 28. So we got 71 and 28 as the vapor pressure contributions from this mixture, which represents a vapor concentration or percentage of 72% for the methanol and 28% for the water. The overall or total pressure inside this container at 80 degrees based on this mixture is 99 kPa's. If I had more methanol in here at this temperature, this pressure would be higher because the methanol is more volatile and it'll turn into a vapor quite easily at 80 degrees Celsius. If I had more water in here than I had methanol, let's call it 80, 20 or whatever, the water doesn't really vaporize until it gets closer to 100. So this pressure would be a lot lower. And that's what we're gonna look at on the next slide, which is this one. So here at 75 degrees, we do the same kind of math. But given the vapor pressures at 75 degrees, so if I had a, just a container containing only water and I heated it to 75 degrees Celsius, it would exert this much pressure on the vessel. If I had a container of just methanol and I heated it to 75 degrees Celsius, it would generate this much pressure. So if we compare the two, you can see here at 80 degrees, which is a little bit warmer, we generate 47 kPa. At 75 degrees, which is a little bit colder, we generate 39 kPa. So that makes sense, right? The, the colder the temperature is, the less of the water is going to evaporate, thus we're going to have less pressure. Applies the same to the methanol. But if we do the, uh, take that mix that we had from the previous tank, the 60% the methanol, 40% water, we've now evaporated some of it. Now we've got a new tank that, that contains that that new mixture concentration, which was 72% methanol and 28% water. And we apply our fancy math again here. So 0 0.72 times 149 would give us 107 kPa's. Uh, 0.28 times 39 kPa's would give us 11. And then we do the ratio of percentages to those kPa's. And we'll see that our concentration of the methanol is now 91% versus 72%. And the water is 9% versus 28%. And that is directly related to the fact that water can't vaporize as readily at a lower temperature. Methanol still can. Its vapor temperature, I think, is around 70. So in theory, all the methanol would eventually vaporize at this temperature. And none of the water would technically vaporize until it got to 100. So you can see in a very simple uh, temperature spread or a big temperature spread like that, how you can isolate something that doesn't vaporize from something that is far more volatile. So the more volatile it is, the, the lower temperature it will vaporize at. Okay, so uh, here it says, what product is more volatile? Well, the answer, of course, is the methanol is more volatile, and it's indicated by the fact that it has a higher vapor pressure at a given temperature. That's very fundamental, so I hope you understand that. All right, so that is what happens if we were just to take it with a, a vessel, kind of like a, a, a batch, I guess, type situation. But of course, that's not what we're down with. We're down with continuous distillation processes uh, and an entire vapor or an entire distillation column. So this is where we'll start talking about the distillation process and all the distillation process is the first tank second tank on top of that third tank on top of that the fourth tank on top of that all doing the same activity but at different temperatures you'll see we have a gradient of temperature starting with a high temperature at the bottom a lower temperature at the top and every step that it goes through the more volatile uh, the more volatile component concentrates itself as it goes up and then the less volatile component stays down at the bottom and that's uh, of course uh, the function of distillation is trying to get the good expensive volatile uh, liquids and gases out of the top of the column so that we can sell them and get rid of all the water and heavy stuff out the bottom that we don't want so as vapor travels up percentage of the more volatile component increases. And if you look at the, um, the different levels of, and the different trays in this distillation column here, you'll see that we start out 
uh, with our feed, which is 31% methanol and 69% water. It goes in there, starts to get heated up. Some of it will turn into vapor and move up to this column here. Some of it will spill over, go down to the heater where, where it will get heated up again, generating more vapor. So it's a continuous process uh, uh, as it heats up. Vapor travels through here, heats up this water, this water gets hot, it vaporizes, that vapor continues to go up. And as we go up, the temperature gets lower and lower, meaning that we get more and more of the volatile stuff and less and less of the non-volatile stuff, which is the ideal plan. But it's, again, much more complicated than that, but that's fundamentally the way it goes. Okay, so distillation columns work on these little trays at every level here. The column contains trays that will maximize the integration of the vapor. Moving up the column, oh, damn it. We kept moving around on my, the wrong slide. So this is what I was talking about here, the, the temperature gradient going up the column here. Hotter on the bottom, colder at the top, and you'll see the concentration, 86% methanol coming off the top. And our feed was 31. So it went from 31% on this tray to 63% on the second tray to 76% on the third tray to 86% at the top. So you can see that the more volatile component here, the, the methanol is getting more and more concentrated as it, as it goes up there. Then the vapor comes up, of course, out of the column into a condenser, which cools it back down again because we cool that vapor into a liquid. And that liquid is what we call distillate or the product that we want to get, and then we pull that off the side and we put it in the tank and we sell it. Or we feed some back into the column. Uh, this is uh, cooler because it went through the condenser. It causes a cooling effect on uh, the liquid in the trays, and that process goes down. And the, the idea of the reflux here is it helps to maintain the temperature uh, in each of these trays. Otherwise, it would just continually keep heating and heating and heating and heating and heating and at some point then we'd start vaporizing water and we don't want that so reflux is fed back in as a, as a cool uh, liquid to come into the trays to cool them all off to try to keep them at the set temperature that we want for each of the different stages and we'll look at how we control uh, the flow through these stages as we uh, go through the power points here okay so each one of those stages has uh, bubble trays in them, um, and these trays are you know, designed to maximize the interaction between the vapor coming up through these bubble caps here, goes through the liquid, heats up this liquid, which causes it to vaporize, it goes up to the next tray, and the process repeats itself. Some of it will flow back down uh, in the form of internal reflux um, to help cool the lower trays. That's really uh, an ingenious system. Um, and then we also additionally will add reflux in, in different areas, and you'll see that as we as we move forward. Long story short, in order to work, we have to have a decreasing temperature gradient between the stages going up, and we have to have vapor going up, and we have to have reflux coming down in order to maintain our stage temperatures. Okay, so next few pages in the ILM here break the distillation process into uh, it's uh, equipment component areas. So we have two basic sections when we take the distillation column um, and when we break it apart. We have the stripping section, which is the bottom section where we, um, where we heat up the feedstock. And then we have the top section or the rectifying section as it's called, where we pull off all of our vapors and condense them and we use our reflux to bring things back in. So there'll be all kinds of um, excuse me, questions on naming the different pieces of equipment. So things like the reboiler, uh, what is the stripping section? What is the accumulator? What does it do? Uh, what is the condenser? What does it do? Um, things of that things of that nature. So as you read, uh, read through there, uh, just pay attention to the name, uh, the names of the component, uh, the components that are put together to, to make the entire the entire system here. So You'll see questions like, uh, is the condenser in the rectifying section or the stripping section? Or where, what section will you find the reboiler uh, in? Questions of that nature there. So it's all based fundamentally off uh, a relatively uh, simple machine where we 
uh, provide uh, we provide some heat to and the feedstock we heat up that feedstock we boil it it turns into a vapor the vapor comes off of here we condense it we take some of it away uh, we take some of it away sorry as product and some of it we feed back into it in in uh, the form of external reflux in order to maintain the temperature gradient between the different trays and then it gets more complicated from from that very basic description. Okay, uh, so I debated whether or not I wanted to show you guys this or not. Um, it's a little bit heavy to wrap your head around here, um, but it's a good way to describe all the different uh, things that are going on in a distillation column and all the variables that have to be considered because uh, if you look at it, I mean, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten transmitters uh, on this thing here. So there's a lot of variables that we have to uh, address when we're trying to control uh, a distillation column. So this is just a diagram that tells you all the different variables. Good news is um, I don't make you, there's no requirement for us to do any uh, of the math. So the math that you're going to be looking at in uh, pages, I don't know, eight, eight, nine, ten, or so, something like that. Just check eight, nine, and ten. Basically, um, basically just walks you through um, some of the variables that we have to be concerned concerned with in terms of controlling it. So I'm not going to get into this too heavily here, but but do look at this uh, thing here because uh, you need to understand what is exactly going on. So major components, of course, in distillation are the feed. This is the raw material that we're feeding into it. It's a mixture of uh, two or more components. And then we're going to have the distillate, which comes off the top, which is our product. And then there's going to be bottoms. And really, distillation is all about uh, how we separate the first components, the feed components, uh, how we separate that into distillate and into bottoms. Is, is one part of the math, and you'll see in the next slide where we'll take um, the, the feed and they'll do some massing. The feed is equal to uh, the, the distillate divided by the bottoms, right? Whatever goes in has to come out, obviously. None of it magically disappears. So we'll talk about ratios there. So the first ratio that it really talks about is the ratio between distillate and bottoms in relationship to the feed. And then we'll talk about uh, the relationship uh, between uh, reflux, feed, distillate, and bottoms as we progress here. So lots of different variables. If we're if we're engineers and we're into the math, this is what we'll be looking at here. Um, molar flow rate F here on the feed. So this is our feed rate. Molar flow rate of the distillate over here is D. Flow rate of the bottoms here is B. Uh, external reflux is L. You'll see, and this will get you familiar with all the different lines coming in really is what it's really going to get you out there. Uh, flow rate for the overhead vapor, of course, here is B. And then we start talking about the percent composition. And don't let the word molar uh, here fool you uh, or confuse you, just disregard it. It doesn't really matter whether it's molar flow rate or standard flow rate or whatever when you're, when you're trying to wrap your head around the basic operation of it. It's just, it's flow rate. Just look at it as flow rate. Okay, then uh, percent col uh, composition of the light key is the percent LKF. So LKF here is the light key feed. So again, you'll read the definitions in the ILM here, but basically it's, uh, we wanna know how much of our feedstock is methanol in our example, the lighter component in our, in our mixture. Uh, second one here, light key in the distillate, how much of it, how much of that lighter material do we have in our distillate? That's over here as a percentage. And they make total sense, right? Light key feed is on the feed. Light key distillate is on the distillate. Light key bottoms is on the bottoms. Um, you might ask yourself, well, for distilling it, why is there any light key on the bottoms? Because the whole idea of distillation is to try to get all that stuff out. Well, it's not 100% effective all the time. So you do end up with some stuff that you don't get. Uh, the good news is we do talk about what happens when we still have light keys in the bottoms. Uh, and we mentioned that, I think, maybe in third year, we said some of the stuff won't, some of the stuff won't uh, 
evaporate at the temperatures that we can provide in an atmospheric distillation. So we have to raise the temperature in order to do that. Uh, we have to use a vacuum fractionating column. So anything that doesn't come off in a normal atmospheric distillation column will be pumped off to a, a different column where it could, again, try to get more of this stuff out of the bottom um, with the idea, of course, trying to get as much volatile stuff out of it as we possibly can. Okay, uh, some more terms in here. Uh, energy supplied by the reboiler, QB, over here, and this is all for calculations that we don't do again, so don't worry too much about it. And then finally, the heat energy removed by the condenser, which is QT, up over here. And it's all about, you know, how much energy do we have to put into this thing in order to heat up a certain mass of, of fluid in order to get the stuff out of it. And it's there's a lot more to it than we get into, but that's where it all that's where it all comes from. So, few little examples here of how these uh, terms uh, relate to each other. So the feed, of course, here is equal to the distillate plus the bottoms, right? What comes in must go out, and then we can do some fancy math on here to determine what is the balance between uh, the distillate, the bottoms, in relationship to our feed, and that's where these terms like key percentages, uh, distillate, bottoms, feed all come into play. But again, uh, not too much of a worry for us uh, as technicians. Okay, so what do we measure uh, out of this coming here? We, what do we measure coming out is called the split. Two things really that are, are the measures of, of what's going on in the column. The first is called the split or the cut, and that relates to the feed that exits either as distillate or bottoms. And then the second term or qualitative measure, I guess, is the fractionation, which is a, a value that's related to the amount of separation uh, that we've achieved or the composition uh, of the distillate and the bottoms. So more terms for you guys to remember, but these are the key, the key measuring terms when people talk about how does it, how's the column working? Oh, well, we got this split or we got this kind of fractionation. That's kind of um, what that's related to. So again, whatever comes in has to go out and how it performs is qualified by the split, which is the amount of stuff that's coming out and fractionation, which is the quality of that stuff that's coming out. So what does that mean here? Uh, long story short, again, looking at some painful math, changing the bottom split or the ratio between the bottom and the feed and the top split or which is the relationship between the distillate and the feed will affect the percentage of light keys in either one of those products, which is, I don't know, not really, it's, it's the way it works. If you look at it, if we, if we change the split, we have more methanol coming up the top. Well, yeah, that's gonna, that's gonna make a difference between how much distillate we get out of it compared to the feed. And it's also gonna make a difference in how much uh, bottoms we get compared to the feed depending on how we how we split it. So this is all just kind of related to the to the math. So vapor flowing up the column, the liquid flowing down the column also affects the splits. So the, the ratio between the bottoms and the feed or the distillate in the feed. So how we run the machine will affect what we're actually getting out of it. And this is all uh, the math that goes along with that. Okay, note says increasing the heat input increases the rate at which the distillate product can be removed. And I think that we could probably close our eyes and visualize that if we got uh, a container that's got something in it that we want to separate and we turn the heat up in it, well, of course, it's going to evaporate faster, right? Uh, up to a point, of course, uh, and then it becomes a problem, which we'll address a little bit later in the PowerPoint. Okay, the next important thing that we have to look at in the in our steady state model of the column is the is the reflux and we mentioned the reflux is a, a return of condensed product back into the system in order to maintain temperature uh, gradient across our trays and the term that we use uh, to describe how much of it we're putting back in is called the reflux ratio and the reflux ratio is the ratio of the reflux flow to the distillate flow so it's the ratio of how much of this stuff are we taking out? You can see it comes out of the accumulator. This is the product that we've just condensed. And the reflux ratio is the ratio between how much we're taking out as product 
and how much we're putting back in to help us maintain our process. Okay, uh, it's a relative measure of heat removal, fancy engineering talk here, um, but it's an essential variable in setting the light key concentration of the distillate because it controls the temperature in those trays and the temperature in those trays is what dictates how much is vaporizing at any given time. Okay, there's a couple different terms here in, in uh, the ratio itself. So infinite ratio uh, relates to feeding all the reflux flow back in. So you're feeding everything that you've distilled back into the machine or nearly everything that you've uh, distilled back into the machine. And then zero ratio, uh, go figure here, no reflux flow and minimum heat re removal. And again, a little bit of math here that, that uh, illustrates that that happens. Uh, the reality is, is that you're always somewhere in between here and there. Okay. Uh, an increase in the reflux ratio causes an increase in the concentration of a light key in the distillate. Okay. So the more reflux I put back in it, of course, I'm putting it back in it. It's running down all the way to the bottom. This is pure stuff. Reflux has been vaporized already. It's pure, basically, as, as pure as we're going to get it out of this column anyway, so 90% or better. So we're adding that in here. Well, where does it go? It runs down the trays all the way into the bottom. So if this was 50% uh, water, 50% methanol, and then we start feeding it pure methanol, well, it's going to increase the concentration of methanol down here, which, of course, is going to increase the amount of vapor that ultimately comes out, and that's the... That's kind of the function of the of the reflux there. So you can do it up to a point, of course, uh, where it wouldn't make sense to feed it all back here and all the time. Otherwise, you just make a continuous circle. Ultimately, you would end up 100% product, but you wouldn't be bringing anything new in. So the idea is you've got to balance how much you're using your reflux to make things more concentrated compared to how much feedstock you're going to feed in there so that you've got throughput of product coming out the end. Long, painful definition. Okay, so that takes us through the, the basic sitting here looking at a distillation column and the, and the function that has to, the functions that have to, you know, occur in order for us to be able to take uh, a feedstock and separate it into uh, distillate and bottoms. So now we take that model and we start applying some control strategies uh, to it that are related to distillation. And there's more than one. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, so once the column is built, oops, sorry, once the column is built, the following variables must be set up for operation. And this is important, the once the column is built, because columns are not generic. You just don't call, you know, you don't call up distillation columns or us and say, hey, I need a distillation column. I want it to be tall and I want it to be shiny. It's got to be built based on what you're expecting uh, to have to distill. So um, it's special ordered and it's built. So it's, there's lots of dynamics and things that are involved in the engineering of the actual fabrication of the distillation column. So that's why I've included this sentence because each column is a little bit different based on what they're, what they're doing. But uh, that being said, they've all got to have a certain number of variables that have to be set up. And that's where we come in. So these variables include the feed flow rate, temperature and composition, uh, the feed tray location. And we'll talk about these individually. And uh, if I don't talk about them individually, there's there's pages on these in the ILM for sure. Um, feed, feed tray location. So whether it's closer to the bottom where it's hotter or closer to the top where it's uh, cooler, that matters. Uh, feed tray location is, uh, is important. And we'll talk about that, I'm pretty sure, later. Uh, column pressure is another variable. Reflux temperature is another variable. Uh, the composition flow rate of the distillate is important, how much we want to take out of it. And the bottom's composition and flow rate is also important, how much, how much we want to send on to perhaps another, uh, another section for further, for further stripping. So six main variables that we have to consider when we're controlling a column. And this is going to start getting interesting for us because uh, the way we define the type of control in the distillation column is based on which of these variables uh, we're actually primarily focusing on. So when we look at the strategies coming up, 
uh, your focus is going to be on trying to determine and understanding where the major control is focused and it'll make more sense in a couple of slides here hopefully okay so what do we got oh page 12 14 long painful design calculation example here uh be sure to concentrate on page 13 which talks about the control variables let me just have a quick looky look here to make sure i'm not shortening you guys on anything important yeah not too much going on there uh it shows a bunch of math uh, dealing with those variables that we were speaking about earlier, our, our F and our Ds and our Bs and our light key fractions and all that kind of wonderful stuff. Um, but there's math involved, of course, and typically an engineer would be doing this kind of stuff. It would already be pre-done before we, as technicians, even get there. So it's not really a requirement for you. Um, but if we look at the diagram on page 13, if you're following along, uh, this addresses all of those controlled variables that we were um, talking about on the previous slide here. So feed flow rate, uh, you'll see it over there, uh, calculated value, uh, tray location that doesn't really address, uh, column pressure, no pressure controller on this one. Um, but it, uh, it talks about uh, the controlled variables and the effects of the changes that you make with those controlled variables and, and what those particular elements do. So for example, it says, Manipulating the cooling flow, uh, which would be the cooling uh, medium that's going into the condenser. Let's see here, cooling flow here. So what is what does FT actually do? And that's what's described on page 13. So uh, manipulating FT2 controls the condenser cooling, right? I asked you what is uh, what does FT4 do? You'll say, well, that controls reflux. What does FT5 do? Well, that controls the distillate. What does FT6 do? It controls the bottom. What does FT3 do? It controls steam flow. What does FT1 perform? Feed flow. What does PT2 do? Column pressure, right? So it relates to all those variables that we were talking about earlier. These guys. Okay, so I'll let you read that on your own. Um, pressure control. So starting to talk about the different schemes um, that are used. And again, uh, they go from kind of basic control to more uh, common uh, control uh, as we progress through them here. So first we start out with pressure control, uh, pressure control on page 15, and that of course is um, controlling the pressure inside the column as a method of uh, controlling our products. So unless, there's our, unless there are incondensable products in the feed, we use something that, that's called a total condenser. Uh, that condenses all the vapor that is that is used. So in its very basic form, um, in its very basic form, we'd use what's called a total condenser. And a total condenser, just as the name implies, condenses all the vapor uh, that is that is used. But as we move forward here in terms of control strategies, here we're going to be looking at these uh, these next three different ones here: uh, water throttling, overhead throttling, and flooded condensers so this is this is methods that are used to control pressure inside the column okay so you're going to have to be able to identify them uh, so handy dandy uh, pieces of advice uh, as we're going through here uh, I've got circled the components that are relative to the particular uh, method of control so water throttling as the name would imply, throttling the water, right? So we have a valve on the cooling water. Uh, it would be nice if they called it cooling water. They don't, but cooling water. This is the only place that there's that there's uh, that there's water, and we use that water to control the uh, temperature of the condensate. In turn, feeding that back in here. So if I feed hotter stuff in here, it's going to make the column hotter, hotter vapor, of course, is going to increase the pressure, correct? If I feed in cooler, which is what we do by increasing the cooling flow, we cool our uh, distillate more, we feed our cooled distillate into the column, well, that's going to make the column cooler, that's going to decrease our pressure. So that's the concept of water throttling for pressure control. 
characteristics of water throttling method here. They're slow acting uh, because it manipulates the coolant in the condenser. Again, the condenser is a big capacity device, so it takes some time for temperature to change. So it's slow. This is appropriate when the process is operated near design conditions most of the time. In a perfect world, I guess that would happen. So water throttling, be able to identify what's going on here. And you'll see as we go by here, nothing going on with these transmitters at all, right? No valves here, no, no connections of any kind. So you can get the relationship between pressure and water flow, water throttling. Next one, overhead throttling. So again, the names of these strategies are relatively uh, descriptive and fairly accurate uh, visually looking at them. So overhead throttling, well, that's throttling the overhead products. And lo and behold, there's a valve that we're using connected to a pressure controller. Remember, this is all pressure control still. So we're measuring the pressure and we're throttling the amount of vapor coming out. Good way to control the pressure, right? Open the valve, release the pressure, close the valve, increase the pressure. Characteristics, uh, faster acting, because uh, it manipulates the flow. Flow is a very quick process. Not as common uh, because of a large control valve requirement and the large pressure fluctuations that it would create inside uh, the, sorry, the accumulator here, right? The pressure would be increasing and decreasing. You get shrink and swell and all kinds of wonderful things going on. But again, identifying this as what type of pressure control is this? How do I guess? How do I know? I'm just a I'm just a uh, uh, lowly fourth year instrument apprentice. Well, what am I controlling? Pressure, because I have a pressure controller here. And what is it manipulating? The overhead vapors, so overhead throttle and pressure control. Last but not least method of controlling a, the pressure here is called flooded condenser. Mm, look here, flooded condenser. Look, we got water, we got distillate inner condenser. Haven't seen that yet, have we? Look, nothing in there. Nothing in there, nothing in there. We got something in there. So pretty good indicator that we've got a flooded condenser when there's liquid in it. Basic idea here is we'll use a flooded condenser when the coolant flow is constant and cannot be manipulated. Um, I don't really know how to describe that here because it looks to me con coolant flow is constant and cannot be manipulated it looks to me like i could manipulate this but let's not worry about it um how do we how does it control the pressure pressure transmitter pressure controller valve controlling the amount of flow that comes out of the condenser to the accumulator which in turn gets fed either back into the into the column via reflux causing a decrease in temperature or decrease in pressure. So manipulates the flow out of the condenser, which varies the tube's surface area and cooling ability. So it actually, because it's flooded, doesn't have the interaction between the vapor and the coils that it would have in this scenario here. So it varies this tube surface area and thus the cooling ability of the condenser. So again, being able to identify these three types of pressure control, fairly easy to do uh, based on the, on the name and, and how that name relates to what's actually going on. So flooded condenser, pretty easy to identify, but do pay attention to the, the, the uh, distinguishing differences between uh, these three methods of pressure control. And then we'll talk more about different types of control coming up here. Okay, so that was pressure control. Uh, one of the other things we have to control is, of course, product composition. So what are we taking out of it? And that's a little bit more complicated, um, but we look at it in two different terms and it's, it's a little bit confusing first time through in the ILM, so take your time uh, reading through it. I've boiled it down here into a nice easy way for you to be able to reflect back on it after you've read it and go, okay, I, I kind of get this, um, but as we go through here, we're going to be describing uh, composition control in two different ways. Uh, the first way is called 
conventional energy balance type scheme. And then we'll talk about a conventional material balance type scheme and the variables that are involved in each of them. And there's going to be pictures involved with each of them. Um, but we'll go through, or you guys will go through the basic operation. I'm not going to walk you through them step by step. Um, but I will tell you what to look for as, as you go into that meeting. So long story short, when we're talking about conventional energy balance here, it's a method that sets the column heating or cooling directly. Okay, and the way it does that is through heating control or reflux control. I'll have slides on these individuals as we move on. This is just kind of what we're going to be looking at as we move forward. So uh, associate heating and reflux with conventional energy balance. And you'll see this in a second. When we're talking about conventional material balance, we're going to be looking for control on the distillate or bottoms flows. Okay, so distillate or bottoms will be related to material and heating and reflux will be related to energy balance. This is just to uh, something for you to focus on as we move forward into the next couple of slides. The golden rule here, or the, the super tip, is look for where the set point is as a general identification rule. So you'll see as we look through uh, the next diagrams, you'll find uh, you know, a valve that controls the bottoms, a valve that controls the distillates, a valve that controls the reflux, the valve that controls the heating and the set point will move around uh, as we go through these diagrams and if you follow where that set point is you'll be able to associate it with the composition control scheme that we're actually trying to identify okay so let's see if my theory holds true heating control so if i said heating control is a component of what type of uh Composition control scheme, you'd say, oh, it's energy balance. Heating and reflux are energy balance, okay? So operator adjusts the set points of FC3 and TC4 in order to set the energy balance. What is the energy in this case? Energy is steam. So uh, FC3, controlling the flow of the steam or the heat in this case, and TC4 which is over here, which is temperature in the column, right? So if we look back here, heating control and reflux control. So let's look for some set points. Set point here on the heating component and set point here on the reflux component, right? Set point, controller, reflux. So if you look for the set points, one's on heating, one's on reflux, One's on heating, one's on reflux. We can then say that that diagram is an energy balance diagram. Just believe it or not, this is simple. It's worse when you read it, trust me. I, could, I should have another arrow here probably pointing to that set point. So let's look to see what happens. Next slide here. Oh, I, I did have arrows. No, I didn't. Okay, uh, reflux control. Oh, yeah, this is the same one. Doo, doo, doo. What have I got going on here? Oh, sorry, reflux control. Where am I going here? I've lost, I've lost myself here. Heating control, same thing. Looking at the same slide, reflux control. All right, here we go. Um, geez, I'm having a brain fart right at the moment, gentlemen. There's the reflux set point. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, there should be a set point shown on the drawing for temperature controller three. Um, that's not that's not shown. Um, the key point here, of course, is uh, the reflux control on this one. Okay, next slide here. Uh, distillate control. So, looking at distillate control, how do we know it's distillate control? Because there is a set point over here on distillate. Okay. So the operator will adjust the set point for TC3, which is way over here, and FC5 to set the material balance. So again, set point here, set point here, material balance. We got heat, we got distillate. Does that match with what I was telling you earlier? Uh, no, we got distillate and bottoms, my bad. What is going on here? Got too many arrows going on here. Okay, bottoms control. Uh, again, 
uh, operator adjusting the set point for GC4 and FC6 in this case because it is bottoms. Set point at bottoms, bottoms control. Set point at distal, at delete control. Set point at reflux, reflux control. Set point at steam, heating control. Four slides. Hopefully that was a solid explanation for you to uh, be able to identify those things. Oops. All right, those are, believe it or not, basic control strategies. Now we move into some advanced control strategies and advanced control strategies are really actual control strategies because in a refinery, when you're distilling uh, and you're pulling products off of them, you are going to want to ensure the quality of those products, of course. So that column is going to be ultimately run by an analyzer, most likely. So different control strategies or advanced control strategies, if you will, include analyzer control, uh, different feed rate changes, and feed rate and composition changes. And I believe we'll have a slide on each of them. Okay, analyzer control. Again, identification, pretty easy to find. Um, you can uh, generally chase down uh, the set point, but in this case, it's not going to make ourselves very happy. Um, so analyzer control. Uh, this is a uh, grab, grab style analyzer diagram here. You don't actually see an analyzer in here anywhere. Um, but a little talk in the ILM on page 26. Um, that talks about this distillation process and what happens in this analyzer control lab sample version is we'll go and the operator will come every once in a while and he'll grab a sample of the distillate and he'll take it to the lab they'll analyze it at the lab and if there's any quality issues they'll they'll make ch changes in here um, the change that they use to measure against is the output of the temperature transmitter which is indicative of what's going on in that particular column and what temperature they're using to get the product that is volatile at that temperature. Uh, so they compare the lab, uh, the lab sample to what they think they should get at that temperature. And if it's not correct, they'll adjust the temperature so that they're getting the correct product. So this is not the way ultimately a, a continuous column is gonna work because you're not really gonna have uh, an operator out there running and grabbing samples all the time. Because if you're pumping product through here that's off spec for a few hours, well, that costs you lots of money. So of course you're gonna wanna evolve to analyzer control pump with an analyzer. So here you see, we've got an analyzer that is measuring our condensate. After it comes through the condenser, it turns into distillate. We now have an analyzer, should have a number AT in there going to a controller that will throttle the distillate valve based on the quality of our uh, of our condensate if it's not concentrated enough it'll feed it back in as reflux and it'll go through the process again if it's good it'll let it out as product um, in this case of course don't need a lab sample because we have a built-in analyzer so this is analyzer control and this is probably pretty close to uh, the way most refineries would probably be doing it is everybody still alive out there? I haven't heard a voice or a fart or anything. You're doing good, Captain. All right, good. Just want to make sure I'm not talking to myself. Tim said he had a talk to himself lecture the other day, and I thought that must have just sucked. All right. Uh, how do we control doing feed rate changes or reflux flow changes? So another method of controlling. Um, the use of steady state material and energy balance equations, engineering talks can be used to develop a static model. So we can calculate how we can make this run if we do some, some testing. Um, long story short, this is more engineering level stuff here, but um, by controlling the amount of feed coming in, look at all the wonderful control elements that we got going on here um, and, and controlling the amount of uh, reflux that we feed back into it, we can obviously control uh, our product and a very complicated looking control screen here. We got some feed forward action uh, going on. And there's a little bit, let me just check. There's a couple of page explanation, I believe in the ILM on, on this particular process. But again, 
uh, being familiar with the types of strategies is, is more important than being an absolute guru on each particular step in that method. So page 28 here, feed rate changes, feed rate changes, composition changes. Yeah, there's a bunch of a uh, bunch of pages of explanations of what's going on in here that would uh, I wouldn't even be able to, I would have to read them to you and there's no point uh, in me doing that. Okay, uh, feed rate and composition changes is covered on page 30. So uh, again, um, I'm not fluent enough in it that I could just regurgitate it to you right off the top of my head. It's a lot safer for me to let you just kind of have the diagram in front of you and read through the bullet point process of, of what's going on here. Um, long story short, be able to identify uh, what kind of controlling is going on as it associates to the type uh, of uh, scheme that we're, we're trying to identify. Um, yeah, let's just have a look, see here. How can we identify this? Feed forward effects. The feed valve so we see the feed forward here yeah i can't think of anything feed forward over here on reflux so maybe that's the way you can associate it uh, i'm just thinking to myself here okay uh feed rate and composition changes very different looking diagram here uh, the analyzer adjusts the distal flow according to the feed compensation using feed forward so we have our analyzer here uh, set point Going into our analyzer, we've got a, a flow uh, selector here, and we've got a signal coming from uh, an analyzer feed analyzer, and we also have an analyzer on the distillate flow. So we connect them together, and the relationship between what's coming in and what's going out is the method that they use here in a nutshell. I know it's a little bit heavy, but um, when you take the time and you have a picture in front of you and you read through the steps, it should make uh, some more sense to you. Okay, model predictive. I always hate when they throw in these model predictive ones here on page 33. Model predictive, again, is a, is a model. It's a calculation based on uh, experimental values or measured values or tested values. And the feed rate composition with model predictive measures the disturbances with all of these different devices. So FT1, AT1, AT5, AT6, PT2, FC2 uses all these measurements, then uses the data collected to make a process model that will be applied to the, to the column. And hopefully that model will work. Theoretically, it should. Okay, so up till now, we've been talking basically about binary uh, distillation, that is separating two components. Um, really, in a column, you can pull a component off of every single tray if you wanted to, because every tray is a different temperature. So different products, if there's a mix, will boil off at those temperatures. Um, if you remember from third year chemistry, we talked about the carbon chain uh, and the length of the carbon chain has to do with its volatility and short carbon chains had high volatility and low boiling temperatures. You'd find them at the top of the column and long chain hydrocarbons at higher boiling points. So you'd find them down at the bottom of the column and you could have a variation of products between the top and the bottom. So if we look at the diagram here, we have the spread between the the bottom where it's hotter and the top where it's cooler and we can pull off different products you can see down here we're pulling off lube oil next tray we're pulling off diesel next tray up we're pulling off kerosene next tray up we're pulling off gasoline so you see the components are getting lighter as we go up the column shorter carbon chains less density then you take the stuff that comes off the bottom the very bottom stuff the stuff that doesn't vaporize it 400 degrees. If we turned up the temperature more, it would burn. That would be bad. We talked about this in third year. So we pump it off to a vacuum column, which can boil things at a lower temperature. And then we can strip our bottom products into more heavier, uh, light heavies, if you want to call them light heavies, um, 
over here. Long story short. Uh, so how do we do that? Fractions are removed from the side of the column at specific points. Trade temperature, again, trade temperature determines the composition. Additional heat is removed, missing a D there, by the scenario that we see here, which is called a pump round. We take some of the product and feed it back in to help cool this thing to make sure we have distinct variations between the trays. So pump around, which removes the hot liquids, cools it, and injects it in a higher tray, thus controlling the temperatures and making sure we have nice gradients, good clean separations in the temperature gradients so that we get solid products coming out at each level. Lots of stuff to wrap your head around in a short period of time. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's kind of fascinating than it is to me, I guess, a little bit. It's a lot more fascinating if you were distilling whiskey, but we're not. Same science applies, though. Okie dokie. What else we got here? More on multi-component separation. So uh, once you get heavies, bottoms, for example, we, we push them on a, a vacuum tower where we can run them through. Um, again, um, we can also do the same with the stuff that comes at the top, right? We're still dealing lube oil, diesel, kerosene. These are all uh, liquids still at this point, right? We've vaporized them, we've condensed them. They're all liquids, but we can get more out of we can get more out of this than just gasoline. More expensive things. The higher up we go the column, generally, the more expensive the products are. What happens here? Multiple component separation using different stages. So here we have different stages where we're taking um, the, the gases, in this case, uh, liquid natural gas, and at different stages and different pressures and different temperatures, as you see here, using a reboiler, taking some of the product off every time as one type of product, feeding the bottoms into the next stage. We can now get even lighter components out of uh, a sample, uh, the ethanes, the propanes, the butanes, uh, the one, two, three, four carbon chain uh, items that come off as gases. So from our raw crude oil that we sucked out of the ground, uh, we separated the water and the oil and the gas and we've distilled it. And now we've got all these wonderful products that come out. So everything comes off at a specific temperature uh, and that is related to pressure, which thankfully we don't get into the relationship between temperature and pressure uh, too much here in, in Port here. So that's uh, that's the way we get all of our products out of our refineries. Okay, objective three, uh, we're going to talk about common problems associated with distillation control. So all the stuff that can go bad. Uh, this is uh, this is good and cool because you can simulate all this stuff uh, when you get to do the distillation lab uh, in a couple of weeks. But you would want to do this at work because it would cost you a lot of money and make lots of people unhappy. Um, but you can simulate all these problems um, at the college because there is no consequence. So let's look at some of the common problems associated with distillation control. Okay, when we have uh, adjustments or, or things happening that are outside of the process the line design limits, we can run into issues. Remember, every column is specific, uh, built on some engineering values that some really smart people calculated and it's supposed to be run a certain way uh, and you've got rogue operators out there who think that they can you know change the world and they may change things and make things go bad some of the problems include flooding dry trays and weeping so these are physical things that happen within the tower and we'll talk about them individually in a second and we can also have problems related to our feed component, okay? And that will include uh, vapor distillate and feed that has inert gases in it. And it doesn't make any sense right now with no context, but these are what we'll talk about. So five basic problems that we're going to talk about in terms of distillation here. Three of them are related to the, uh, the way we pump things uh, through the machine, and two of them are related to what we're feeding the machine, the actual feed going into the machine. Okay, first problem we're going to talk about is called flooding. Flooding, like it sounds, is the excess, excess accumulation of liquid inside the column. 
problem being that excess liquid can block the vapor movement up the column and cause something called puking. And it's a fun one to, to do, and it's really easy to do. Um, it's quite simple. You, you uh, have too much liquid inside the column. The, the gas can't push its way through here, and it just builds up and starts puking. And it quite literally starts puking. It, it becomes flooded, and nothing is going up, so it goes down. How we detect this? We can measure the differential pressure in order to detect flooding. An increase in differential pressure between the trays and a decrease in the temperature between the trays will indicate flooding, right? If, if, uh, if I can't get my gases up through here, there's going to be a higher pressure here than there is on the tray above it because it's not getting any vapor anymore. So we can use that as a uh, a measure or an indicator to tell us that we have flooding. We'll also have a large difference in temperature because the vapor, again, is not going up there to, to do any heating. So it's going to create a, a greater, um, or sorry, a, a de decrease in the differential temperature. The temperatures are going to be closer together. So flooding is indicated by uh, an increase in differential pressure and a decrease in differential temperature. Long story short, that was a little bit painful. Next issue is dry trays, a little bit harder to do, um, but dry trays, as the name would imply, do not have enough liquid to work correctly. Dry, tray, dry trays can be indicated by a decrease in differential pressure and temperature as well. So one of them here was an increase in differential pressure and a decrease in temperature. This one here is a decrease in pressure and, and temperature at the same time. Okay, so excellent test questions. Uh, I've noticed my distillation column is indicating a decrease in differential pressure and temperature between trays three and four. What is likely occurring? The answer would be dry trays, right? Lastly, but not least, weeping. Not what happens after your typical Oilers game, but something related to distillation. Weeping occurs when liquid in the trays leak through the vapor passages onto the tray below due to low vapor flow up the column, aka you don't have enough heat at the bottom to make the vapor rise up. Problem associated with this is it can lead to something called dumping, where liquid from all the trays cascades to the base of the column. Very similar to puking in its response. Um, but this involves all trays, not just a tray. Okay, a sharp differential pressure drop across the tower indicates weeping. I believe that. I believe that's the proper definition. I didn't really include it, include it here, but let's just make sure that's right. Maybe in a sharp differential from in the column, yes, indicates weeping. So not just a tray, the entire column. Now, issues related to what we're feeding into the machine or what we're taking out of the machine. Um, vapor distillate. So vapor distillate is produced when the next process requires a vapor or the distillation equipment cannot liquefy all the components in the distillate. So sometimes you're going to have a situation, and we saw one earlier here, where we have a step then we have another step, we have a step, then we have another step. So sometimes, in this case here, we've taken in liquid natural gas, we're putting off a, a vapor, uh, and we may be feeding um, more vapor into the next one, or we may be feeding more liquid into it. The idea here is we're looking at processes where we are going to be feeding, sorry, uh, feeding things forward here. So vapor distillate is produced when the next process requires vapor where the distillation equipment cannot liquefy all components. So basically what happens here is you look, vapor's coming off, coming over, going to condenser. It's condensing some of it, depending on how much cooling water we got going in here, condensing some of it, some of it's going back into our system. Some is not coming off the bottom here and going out as distillate liquid. We have it coming off the top as distillate gas. Okay, that's, 
that's called vapor distillate okay vapor distillate uses a partial condenser that ensures that some liquid accumulates for reflux use but we also get some vapor that we can use for the next system that requires uh, vapor feed with inert gases so sometimes you get feeds that have inert gases in them. Not everything that comes out of the ground is pure hydrocarbons, as we know. It's water, it's air, it's sulfur, it's H2S, it's nitrogen, salt, you know, there's all kinds of stuff in it. So beans containing inert gases that do not condense, right? Inert gases like nitrogen, uh, very difficult to get them to condense. Uh, you can do it, of course, because we can buy liquid nitrogen, but it's not something that occurs easily and certainly not in the distillation process so when we have feeds that contain inert gases that do not condense they can cause a blockage in the vapor flow to the condenser da, 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 da. over here how do we get over that we use a flooded condenser with a bypass that allows inert gases to pass around hmm. where is that bypass right there right our gas comes out normally comes over to the condenser and goes down to the accumulator and then back into our system here with our flooded condenser and again flooded condenser got liquid in it doesn't usually have liquid in it flooded condenser and here's our here's our bypass flooded condensers condense more vapor when the level drops dropping the column pressure there's a much better description i'm pretty sure on page 40 um, but that's that's the that's the dirty way of uh, of dealing with uh, inert gases in our in our feedstock. So if they won't condense, we just bypass them, send them in there, and then they get taken off as inert. Wonderful stuff. I think we're really close to the end here. We are. Okay. So summary, long, uh, short summary for a rather long and involved topic. Distillation is a process that uses vaporization and condensation to separate a liquid mixture, most times. The product composition uh, in a distillation process can be controlled using a conventional energy balance where we, where we are controlling the heating and reflux, or conventional material balance where we're controlling the distillate or the bottoms, or we can use more advanced control strategies such as analyzer control, feed forward, and model predictive as we discussed. Flooded trays, dry trays, and weeping are the results of adjustments that are outside the design limits. And requirements for vapor distillates or feeds with inert gases may be required uh, you to have a partial condenser or a flooded condenser with a bypass. Boom. Oh, that just caused a brain cell to pop in the left side of my brain. And that's the end, my friend. <laughs>